spilling 162 million times man-made toxins into the environment. And as we are releasing them, it's as much as 600,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs mm. exploding every day mm. on the continent, in fact, and throughout the world. Mm. Has the situation improved? No, it's unfortunately it's gotten worse. Uh, and the climate crisis continues to get worse faster than we are implementing the solutions. We have the solutions, but we need to remove the obstacles to implementation. When I say it's getting worse, yes, we're still putting 162 million tons of heat-trapping man-made pollution into the sky. And the sky is a very thin shell around the planet. It's just five to seven kilometers uh, thick, the part that we're filling up with this pollution. It's the blue part of the sky where the oxygen is. Uh, and it is now trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 750,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding on the Earth every day. The amount continues to go up because this pollution stays there. On average, each molecule lingers in the sky for about 100 years. But again, we have the solutions. We just need better policies and more a, a greater sense of urgency to implement the solutions. And do you see that sense of urgency, at least, over the period? And, and what, what do you hear world leaders talk about? Do you, do you sense that there's that sense of urgency to deal with this threat that we're faced with? I sense the, a great sense of urgency among young people, uh, including young people here in Africa. Uh, and some leaders uh, have expressed uh, an adequate sense of urgency, but most uh, have not. Uh, and the fossil fuel companies, uh, coal, oil particularly, and, and gas, uh, they are better at capturing politicians than they are at capturing emissions. They have uh, seized control of the policymaking process in too many countries. Uh, so you see subsidies for the use of fossil fuels, even though they're destroying the future of humanity. Uh, you see them trying to block uh, the uh, installation of windmills and solar panels and uh, the shift over to electric vehicles uh, and the implementation of battery factories. So uh, Africa has contributed the least to this uh, crisis, but it is suffering the most in, in many ways, and it has the greatest opportunity to implement the solutions. 60% of all of the solar energy that hits the land masses of the Earth is here in Africa. And solar electricity is now the cheapest electricity in the history of the world. And it continues to get cheaper. So Africa needs to, in my opinion, break free of fossil fuel colonialism uh, and implement the solutions to the climate crisis that will benefit Africa create uh, a cleaner environment, create three times as many jobs as money invested in, in the dirty, poisonous fossil fuels that dominate today, uh, and give young people a sense of hope about the future, which is also very important. Mm, and and you, you talked about that uh, fossil fuel colonialism. You spoke about the World Bank mm. being a part of this fossil fuel colonialism that, that's, that's being pushed, especially with Africa being a victim of, of that strategy. What do you mean by that? Well, that is one area where we have had some progress. The former head of the World Bank was a climate denier uh, in league with the fossil fuel polluters. But we now have a new head of the World Bank, Ajay Banga, uh, who understands the need to solve the climate crisis, and he is moving boldly to implement new policies. But the World Bank also needs an infusion of more money from the wealthy countries of the world. Uh, and the World Bank, in cooperation with other multilateral development banks, should help to organize a program of debt reduction, debt cancellation, debt relief uh, for African nations, in, in return for uh, agreements to protect nature and to adopt better climate solutions. 
because the indebtedness of African nations has risen in the wake of the pandemic and in the wake of Russia's uh, sadistic invasion of Ukraine, which has pushed food prices uh, much higher. Uh, so we also need reforms in the global system of allocating capital so that countries in West Africa, for example, don't have to pay interest rates that are a multiple of the interest rates paid by nations in North America and Europe. And do you see uh, the, the sense of reception of this proposal on the part of the World Bank to accept this world, uh, the, the, the debt cancellation, debt forgiveness option to also offset the impact that some of these policies um, is having on, on, the, on the continent of Africa? Those discussions are just beginning. Uh, the, the concept of canceling debt in return for protection of nature and protection of the climate was a concept that began uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, but it needs to be returned to the global stage because the, the debt service payments here in Ghana, well, in Africa generally, the amount that African nations pay uh, to service their debt is twice as high as the amount being invested in renewable energy. That's obviously uh, n not the situation that we need. Uh, and the world as a whole needs to rise to this occasion and work with Africa and all the nations of Africa to implement these reforms. Uh, and, it, and it is that commitment that I, I ask whether that has been exhibited. Do you see this happening, that there's a commitment to actually help Africa in this regard? Well, I, I think the new head of the World Bank, Ajay Bang, as I said, uh, is committed to the kind of progress we need. But the wealthy nations that should be recapitalizing the World Bank and helping the World Bank uh, do its job, uh, with them, that discussion is just beginning. The African Leaders Climate Summit uh, a few months ago in Nairobi was really an inspiring event for me because the African leaders spoke very clearly about the need to put a tax on uh, the, these polluting uh, fuels mm -hmm. and to seek reforms that will enable African nations to gain more access to borrowing money and gaining financing for the installation of renewable energy. Uh, you talk about the world leaders having a credibility problem. Mm. Well, for example, uh, the, the conference of the parties that will be held in Dubai in ne next month, <laughs> the, the head of that conference is the CEO of one of the largest and dirtiest fossil fuel companies. That's absurd. Uh, that uh, company, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, um, is beginning plans to greatly expand their production of oil and gas by 50 uh, percent. Their PR firms advised them to hold off until two weeks after the, the summit the meeting. Uh, but they're expanding the production of these polluting fuels even as the world is trying to reduce the emissions from those fuels. Uh, and they're, they lack credibility when they say, uh, that the solution is to try to capture the emissions, mm -hmm. to go ahead and burn more and more uh, oil and gas, but then try to capture the emissions as, it's, as they're burned. It, it, it's, it doesn't work. It's not practical. They can uh, capture a little bit at great expense, but it's not a realistic solution. The solution is to phase down the use of fossil fuels and to phase out fossil fuels when instead uh, these companies are doubling down on more and more fossil fuels. Well, you earlier made reference to the heads of states of Africa, the climate summit in, in Nairobi. Mm. For us here on the continent, listening to all the speeches that were made mm. and the commitments, the verbal commitments that were made to, to help fight climate change on the continent, there's a lot more focus or that, that sense that you get the leaders on the continent looking at what they can get mm -hmm. from this climate change conversation mm -hmm. in terms of the monetary value of the trade you know, measures that are put in place mm -hmm. as against the commitment to really fight 
climate change or putting measures in place to address the issues of climate change, um, you know, on, on the continent. So beyond the words, mm. do you do you see any sense of commitment to put policies in place apart from what, you know, the, the monetary value they can get? Yeah, well, it varies from country to country. Uh, yours is a perceptive question because, yes, uh, you will often hear these leaders put uh, most of their emphasis on getting money from the rich countries. And I sympathize because uh, the African nations need to, to get more money in order to move forward. But that, but that, is n that should not be the, the primary objective. It's difficult uh, to come up with solutions uh, that don't require money, so I, I understand what they're saying. But there are a lot of initiatives that can be taken by African nations themselves, even as the world uh, responds to this uh, need for more resources. For example, many African nations are still subsidizing the burning of fossil fuels, forcing their taxpayers to give money to the fossil fuel companies to encourage more and more use of fossil fuels. Instead, those subsidies should be removed and the resources should be put into the energy transition and the sustainability solutions that are, are going to help us resolve this climate crisis. Because you talk about uh, solar being one of the cheapest sources of... The cheapest now. The, it's the, the, cheapest the cheapest source of electricity in the history of the world. But here in Ghana, it's actually a very expensive option, even though we have a lot of sunshine for, for that matter because of you know, the, the cost of acquiring some of these the solar panels and so on, which which is not a government policy as yet. So you will still, as an individual, have to commit a lot more money if you want to have solar as an alternative source of power for you to use. Well, um, you know, uh, it's interesting uh, here in Ghana to look at what just happened this summer in Nigeria, where the new government there eliminated uh, many of the subsidies for petrol. And what happened? So many of the businesses in Lagos have stopped using diesel generators and have installed the solar panels on their roofs instead. And once the taxpayer subsidies, the government subsidies for diesel are removed, then the solar uh, electricity is much cheaper. Yeah. So part of the solution uh, to this barrier that some have felt in installing solar is to eliminate the subsidies for the dirty uh, diesel power and fossil fuel power. And you know, when you burn fossil fuels, whether it's diesel or petrol or, or, or uh, coal or gas, you not only create the climate uh, crisis, it also creates conventional air pollution, which kills millions of people around the world every year. And the, air, the conventional air pollution here um, in, in Accra yeah. is due to quadruple in the next couple of decades because of the increasing use of fossil fuels. Instead, we could make people healthier with cheaper sources of electricity that have no pollution whatsoever. Mm -hmm. and, and the studies show that for each dollar invested in renewable energy, there are three times as many jobs created as a dollar invested in the dirty and poisonous fossil fuels. Now, I mean, you've been committed to this fight against um, climate change and, and then also all the practices that increases pollution globally. As, as a young congressman, as a, as a vice president, and over the years that you've You've, you've tried to put in all the measures and travel around the world to make your case and get the message across. Do you think that you've, 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 you've gotten this message across quite clearly um, as to how the danger we're faced with, the threat that we're faced with right now as a result of climate change? No, I don't. Uh, I've tried and I'm not done yet. <laughs> and uh, this training that I'm holding here in Ghana with the Climate Reality Project uh, is designed to communicate uh, this message more effectively here in Africa and here in West Africa. Um, I say that I have not uh, succeeded yet because we have not 
not yet seen the changes in policies that are, are necessary. Many people are still not fully aware of how dangerous this crisis is. Uh, it is not only the huge downpours that have caused the dams to fail and has caused flooding in multiple places in Ghana. It's also the melting of the ice at the North Pole and the South Pole is raising the l level of the seas. And you know, in many of the coastal areas of Ghana, many buildings are being lost to the sea. Uh, and we are seeing temperatures increase. We're seeing new uh, strains of mosquitoes carrying malaria, taking root here in Ghana for the first time. Uh, this new, uh, m newly discovered mosquito is resistant to all of the different insecticides that now exist, and it carries both kinds of malaria. Uh, there are the droughts uh, in the, uh, n not far north of here are contributing to the violence in countries like uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, and of course there are murderous uh, activities going on in Darfur. Today, the United Nations uh, is telling us about this. There are multiple reasons why this crisis must be addressed. Uh, the, the, the experts on the climate crisis are telling us that we could have as many as one billion climate migrants crossing international borders to escape the heat and humidity that is coming as we continue to trap all this heat with the pollution. So uh, it is extremely dangerous and many people are still not aware of how beneficial the solutions are. We can have a cleaner environment, more employment, uh, hope for the future. So this is a, an obvious choice. I am, am continuing to try to communicate as effectively as I can. And we have a thousand new activists here uh, being trained here in Ghana from all across West Africa. This is the 54th uh, training of this kind uh, that I have held, and we have many more planned. Congratulations to you. It is in order. And uh, this is a very, very important intervention because even with this flooding that we are experiencing in this country, as a result of the increasing water levels in the red, white, and the black voters mm. that also now find their source into the Akonsombo Dam, which led to the rising water levels in the Akonsombo Dam, mm. that led to the VRA having to spill excess right. water, that's led to this, this, uh, the, the flooding in, in many, many areas, right. and that's displaced thousands of people. Right. There isn't even the appreciation that climate change really is could, really the, could, the could, cause, could, of cause of it. And here, here is the reason: all this heat that's being trapped, mm -hmm. the majority of it goes into the ocean, and that causes much more uh, evaporation from the oceans to put moisture in the skies, so that when there is a rainstorm, it becomes much larger in a shorter period of time. The scientists call them rain bombs, and so the infrastructure can't handle these heavy downpours. And that's true in wealthy countries as well as developing countries. We're changing these conditions worldwide. We know the answer. We have the solutions. We need the political will to implement them. But political will is itself a renewable resource. Political will is a renewable resource. Right. Let, let's get a bit more into that. Well, when people gain the knowledge of what the danger is, and what the solutions are, it makes it easier to form the political will necessary for people to reason together and decide to make a commitment to solve this crisis. And uh, do you see that political will being exhibited? Oh yes, I do. I particularly see it with young people. And young people in Africa ha have been lifting their voices and demanding change. And then you see there's a lot of young people, even here in Ghana, demonstrations and so on, demanding that things have to change. Things cannot continue to be the same yes. every time and expecting different results. Should that continue? Oh, yes, definitely. And that's yet another reason to have this training here in Ghana. Uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, when young people continue to advocate for change and when Mother Nature... Uh, intervenes with these terrible disasters, the older people say, oh, maybe these young people <laughs> are right. Maybe we do need to change. 
many policymakers are now beginning to change. Another factor that is leading to change is that the cost of solar electricity and wind electricity and electric vehicles continues to come down. Uh, it's already cheaper. It, it, it is beginning to be cheaper by so much that only fools would not switch over to it. And for, for a lot of the young people, especially because they are not seeing the impact of some of these things that you talk about, partly as a result of you know, issues with corruption and so on on, mm -hmm. on the continent, and, and I'm sure that bothers you as well, you know, the increase in cases of corruption and so on, and the, 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 the seeming lack of commitment by leadership to fight it. What has to be done? Well, when I was uh, Vice President of the United States, uh, I sponsored uh, international conferences to fight official corruption. And of course, it's a, it's a problem in all over the world, but when it gets to the levels of hyper-corruption, then it changes everything. One, one cause of corruption is what the economists call a, a resource curse. W when too much of a country's wealth is in one uh, resource that is extracted in ways that enrich the wealthy elites and the poor people don't get any benefit from it. And the wealthy elites sometimes become vulnerable to accepting bribes in order to keep this system going. Uh, in, um, in Nigeria, 86% uh, of the balance of payments with the rest of the world economy comes from fossil fuels. 0.6% of the employment that gives income to the people is related to fossil fuels. So it drives inequality that becomes hyper inequality that feeds corruption. So getting away from this dependence on dirty and poisonous fossil fuels is one of the ways to fight against corruption. And you, that's one of the many ways that can be done. What other ways, in your view, um, do you expect that the leaders on the continent must commit to, to fight corruption? Well, transparency uh, is the most important solution. There's an old saying that the best disinfectant is sunlight. <laughs> when, you, when the people can see what is going on, then those who are tempted to be corrupt are scared to uh, continue uh, their nefarious activities. Now, let's uh, talk a bit about the, you are now something you call the climate trace. Yes. At COP27 last year. Tell me more about it. Climate trace is a means uh, of using artificial intelligence, not the uh, chat GPT kind, but the kind that takes many different sources of information and fuses them together. Uh, and we will have a, an announcement on December 3rd in Dubai uh, that will multiply the information a thousand fold. What it does is it gives the world a very clear view of exactly where the global warming pollution is coming from. There's an old saying in the business world that you can only manage what you measure. We're measuring the pollution and identifying where it comes from for the very first time. And that makes it easier for governments, uh, for businesses looking for clean suppliers in their supply chains, and for NGOs and others to put pressure on the biggest polluters to reduce their pollution. So you can use uh, the, this climate trace to identify specific companies in specific countries yes. engaged in some form of pollution? Yes, absolutely. And we can also give options uh, to large businesses that are trying to get cleaner suppliers so that their overall emissions are reduced. Some of the largest companies in the world are now using the climate trace data in order to reduce their emissions. It's, what's the ultimate goal? Is it to name and shame or something? Well, like it, a, uh, that's part of it, mm -hmm. yes, uh, but um, it, it's more than that. It, it's also to identify the easiest ways uh, to reduce uh, the pollution levels uh, and profit by doing so. Companies that want to reduce their pollution and their contribution to the climate crisis are more likely to do it if they can see how to do it without losing money. And there are ways. I'll give you an example. Some steel mills use a technology called blast furnaces. Others use something called electric arc. You can choose to get the same amount of steel 
in the same quantities with high emissions or with low emissions. If a, if a large company needs to buy steel and it wants to tell its customers we're reducing emissions, we can tell them where to go to get the supplies from clean suppliers. Excellent, Algo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so All much right. for sitting with us. Appreciate it.